What's up, Chiefs Kingdom? Welcome to this episode of One on One. I'm BJ Kissel. Obviously, not 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 Mike DeVito. Uh, he's got some things going on. He's taking care of, so we're giving Mike the week off. And I'm sitting here chatting with my guy Jeff Allen. Jeff, there's a lot of things that have been going on in Chiefs Kingdom since that loss. I'm not quite over it yet. I, I'm not mad because there's nothing I could do about it. But it's just it's just kind of down. And it's been you know eight days in Vegas. Where if you see. We're in a hotel right now. We're actually on our way back to Kansas City. Uh, but so much is going on. I want to pound this out before uh, before we get back. But, Jeff, uh, how's everything been going? Uh, there's a lot to catch up on. Yeah, man, that, that obviously was a tough loss. I'm, I'm still dealing with it personally. Um, <laughs> kind of delayed the process of getting to this podcast. And it was one of those where the, the AFC Championship actually being there back in 2018 and losing it to New England, that hurt really bad. But this one actually hurt a lot more for me just because this is a game that um, there was no way we should have lost that game. We were clearly yeah. the better team. And, and unfortunately, you know, some things happened that ultimately <laughs> resulted in us losing. So um, hopefully we learn from it and, and, and we get better. Yeah. I think everybody wants to figure out the why. I mean, that's what the last yeah. week has been like is everybody trying to establish blame or this or that. And I remember from the beginning, just after the games, like I don't want to disrespect the Bengals. But to me, yeah. that had nothing to do with the bad. Joe Burrow is a great player. Jamar Chase is a great player. Like all of these things, the great coaching, like all of that. It just felt like this was the Chiefs gave it away. And that's why it just stings. And that's why I'm still not over it. And I wasn't mad as much as just like, God, this is going to be remembered. Like that's just, that's yeah, going to be a missed uh, opportunity. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. It. Yeah, it's unfortunate that it's going to always be remembered no matter what happens and transpires after this. It's one of those that slipped through our fingertips, and, and it was one of those thing, one of those legacy games for Patrick in particular, where yeah. um, when, when no matter what he does, it's always going to come back to you know a, a situation in a game like this where you say, well, he can't be the goat because of that. So um, it's unfortunate, yeah. but like I said, hopefully we learn from it. Yeah, I, it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the offseason plays out because of those points that you made and you know this and I think that's probably the most disappointing thing for me personally just because I knew some of the like I knew some of the guys who will not be back just based on um the way the NFL business is especially on that defensive side of the football yeah. uh Frank Clark you know the second he signed that deal that was a three-year deal so mm -hmm. I think anybody who's going to be surprised or wondering if Frank's going to be cut or is he worth this? I think Frank kind of like his agent, like everybody just kind of knows when you sign those deals that it's a restructure, but most likely it's a three-year deal because that's when the guaranteed money is up. But same thing with, with Tyron, his three-year deal has come to an end and it's just, you know, hitch, they have to make a decision with him and Spagnolo and all these guys on that side of the ball, like no matter what it is next year, it's not going to be this group, especially no. on the defensive side that could be revamped, which is the disappointing part for me because that core group of guys was Tyron Frank, those guys with Patrick in his prime, it was just going to be a great opportunity to add another point to that legacy title that you're talking about. And instead we just, we're going to have a giant, butt, and we're going to have to watch some of those guys go to other teams when it's just that dynamic, it fit and it worked and it sucks that they only walked away with one during the three years that those guys were together. Definitely. I totally agree. I, I think regardless of, you know, what transpires and what happens with these guys contractually, I think Veach and, and Coach Reed, they, they, they're they going to do a good job of bringing in talent and guys that, you know, fit the mold and, and fit the culture. And, and I don't think Chiefs are going anywhere. They're always going to be in um, championship yeah. contention because of Patrick and the guys that they put around them. So um, I don't expect it to be the same team, especially defensively. You name those three yeah. guys. I, just seeing the way things are and, and the way I know <laughs> – the way the, the way the league works and I know what goes on behind the scenes, I don't expect any of those guys to be back. That's just the way yeah. it goes. I mean, Tyron, for instance, probably would have been re-signed prior to the season. They would have figured something out. Um, that sounds like a numbers thing. Like they can't agree on the value and that's not going to change. So, yeah, we'll see. And, and that's the business side. And that's where, <laughs> you know, you disagree and you have those, you know, conversations that Tyron's impact, you know, for him in particular stretches beyond whatever he does on the field and the yeah. impact for the younger guys. And that's not cliche. That's not BS. That is, you've got a guy in that locker room that a bunch of alphas will listen to. And I've said it before, but it's like that you can't quantify that because there aren't a lot of those dudes. Definitely. So let's, uh, one of the, we 
just talk a little bit about defense. We'll come back to that. But I know somebody that, you know, another Chicago kid and Mike Kafka uh, went to St. Rita up there. Uh, he got an opportunity to move on to the New York Giants as their new offensive coordinator. Uh, had been with the Chiefs since 2017. Uh, had played for Andy Reid as a player. Uh, was a quarterback at Northwestern. Was in Philly with Coach Reid for a little bit now. Uh, had been kind of Patrick's guy behind the scenes uh, from the time that Patrick was drafted. Uh, Mike Kafka was kind of his personal you know, coach that was kind of with him. And so him going on uh, to the Giants has raised a lot of questions about people kind of thought he was the offensive coordinator and waiting. Uh, and we'll get to that in, as it relates to, to Eric the enemy too here in a second. But what was your reaction when you saw that Mike Kafka is going to get that opportunity, go up to the Giants and start uh, being offensive coordinator? I was happy for him. I think it's an opportunity that's deserving. Sucked as a Chiefs fan and knowing what he brought um, to the team in the building. Um, but, but this guy deserves to be an offensive coordinator. A really bright mind. I think he's going to be a head coach one day. Um, has all the attributes, all the tools. Um, sh show good leadership. He was one of the guys that really developed Patrick, you know, to get him to understand the pro game. So I think he's going to do really well in New York. Um, I know Dave Ball. I know the type of guy he is. They're going to mesh well. So I think he only adds value to your team, and he's going to do that for New York. Yeah, it. he was always the name. You didn't hear him talk a lot to the media. And I had personally, even when I was there, didn't talk to him a ton just because the, you know, those position coaches didn't talk to the media a ton. And he was kind of a quieter guy anyway. Yeah. Um, just kind of his mannerism, his personality. But um, everyone you talk to would talk about the value that he would bring uh, just being kind of a, a soundboard for quarterback. Uh, and it's particularly a young one with Patrick kind of bringing him along when they drafted him. I think they did a really good job. We get we talked a lot about Alex Smith and you were there just about how Alex helped Patrick and Alex kind of had Nagy as like his offense yep. order at that time. And Kafka was just kind of like, hey, you've got the young guy. You go take him. And even back when Alex was getting all the credit and for good reason, there were still a lot of people in that building that were saying like Mike Kafka is his guy because they were around each other all the time. Yeah. Um, so it, it's definitely going to be a miss. And um We'll see how it plays out. I think you know better than I do that a lot of these things are figured out well in advance, and we are just getting a slow roll of the news being rolled out to us. So um, a lot of questions about where is Eric Bieniemy going to go? And I like the fact that he'd been linked to the New Orleans Saints just because uh, from his family's from the area before you know his parents uh, and part of his family moved out to San Diego and he went with them. But there's still a, a huge contingent of the Bienemy family that's in the New Orleans and, and Louisiana area. So from that personal perspective, I can see this this particular opportunity meaning a whole lot to him mm -hmm. to be in that city coaching that team um, as a kid who you know spent time there. Yeah, I really hope they give him an opportunity. I mean, this guy is more deserving than anyone that's on the market right now. Um, he's waited his time. His resume speaks for itself. He, he's done everything he can do on his end. Um, so I hope they give it to him, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't get it with the way things have been going. But this guy is a leader of men, um, really motivational, inspirational, all these different things. Yeah. You talk about alpha male and what you bring to a locker room as a player, like in, in Honey Badger's um, scenario. This guy, EB, does the same from a coaching perspective. He makes you want to run, run through a brick wall, brick wall um, holds guys accountable, and just makes everyone better. He bring he adds points to everyone. It's like it's like a it's like a booster. Like he makes every single player better on the offensive side of the ball, even defensive side of the ball. Um, he brings that energy every day, and you know what you're going to get from him. So I hope he gets that opportunity. New Orleans do the right thing. Um, if not, you're missing out. I'll tell you, he is consistent. Yep. That is the one thing. Like, it doesn't matter if it's a, the dog days of training camp. That dude is going to be yelling finish. He's going to be screaming at his guys. And I think my favorite the enemy, it's not necessarily a story, but just kind of the, the change in him was going from, you know, running backs coach where he's just screaming and yelling all the time. And he just can do whatever he wants to to OC at camp where he's got too much going on. He can't yeah. keep the players between <laughs> plays. So that they're kind of figuring out. I remember talking to him about it, just that, how hard is it for you to be mentally like in the calm plays and relaying things and you can't be at guys. He's like, it's kind of hard to be honest yeah. with you. Uh, but that, that was really good. And, and you brought that up and we didn't talk about um, this before we recorded, but you and I have had these conversations before um, offline of you talk about the, the atmospheres, the dynamic of how things are in the NFL right now, yeah. Brian Flores stuff um, would give you an opportunity with the platform. I know this stuff is really, uh, it means a lot to you. And for yeah, definitely. Reason, but 
what what was your reaction when you saw the Brian Flores news and the the, the quiet thing became loud? I think I saw oh, man, that. I applaud him. I mean, that, that takes a lot of courage to do what he's doing. And a lot of people are going to say, well, he's doing it because he's fired or he's not getting a job right now. But that's not why he's doing it. This guy is a top candidate right now. He, he probably was going to get a job, you know, this circuit. But with what he's done now, I don't think he's going to get one just the way it works. You go against the owners, um, you get blackballed. So that's what's going to happen to him. But it had to be done. It really had to be done. I mean, you talk about this league and how long it's existed. I saw a stat over the course of the inception of the league, there's been 500 head coaches and 24 of them have been black. I mean, that's that's crazy. That's a crazy stat. Um, you talk about even mo more recently, you got one current active black head coach in Mike Tomlin. And I, I know I'm always along the lines of hiring the best guy. Like, you always hire the best guy. But you can't tell me that – 31 out of 32 teams or 30 right now, or whatever the number is, the best yeah. guy happens to be a white guy. That, that, that's not the case. Um, that's a little bit of nepotism. It's a little bit of um, unintentional bias and some racism in there too. And, and you'd be blind to not see that. So if you're a stats guy, if you're a numbers guy, just look at the numbers and it'll yeah. give you the answers. So I think there's a, there's a line, I think that, and this is obviously it's a sensitive thing, but it it's interesting to me how sometimes the narrative changes to being the best guy or picking apart um, why a guy shouldn't be a head coach. It doesn't seem to happen on both sides of that conversation where it's just like he shouldn't be because of set this, this and this. Whereas so much more of the decision of somebody becoming a head coach is an NFL owner wanting this person to represent their organization. And that's where, to me, it's the unintentional it, or it's intentional, whatever it is. It's not the are you qualified to be a head coach? I think the decision to your point and the, the stuff not being talked about is just the inherent. This is going to be the leader of my organization and he's going to stand up there and they all look a certain way. And they all represent the people that are making the decisions of who they want representing their organization. They look very similar. And that's the part to me, it's like that has to change and you can't check owners like that. They're the no. owner. They can do whatever they want. So we can have these conversations. We can talk. We can come up with the stats. But until the conversation becomes very mainstream to where people have to answer, like, really, what is happening here? We're going to keep having yeah. this conversation. That's disappointing. And but at least now it's a lot more out there. And it's a lot of stubbornness. Like you said, like the owners are going to do what they want. And I think, you know, with the conversations that are being had, the Rooney rule and all these things giving draft picks to teams, all of these things to incentivize mm -hmm. hiring minority coaches. Owners are looking at it and, and kind of fighting back. Like, I'm going to do what I want. Like, I'm the owner. I'll run this team. And I feel like that's what's going on right now. But it, it, it's just unfortunate, man. You just look at it all and you just you ask yourself the question, why is it this unbalanced and unfair? You know, why is it this unbalanced and unfair? And why isn't change being made? And, and, we, and, and you see the league's response to even Flores' lawsuit immediately it was defense. It was no like, no, there's no problem. I mean, we got, you know, stop hating, you know, and racism on the back of helmets. But mm -hmm. the first thing that you do is to go in defense mode instead of acknowledging, yeah, there's a problem and, and we're trying to fix it. And in the same with New York Giants. I mean, they have, they have, they've never had a black head coach. And <laughs> they're like, nope, this isn't, this isn't the case. No, we hired the best guy. Yeah. It might be true. You might hire the best guy. You may have felt like they ball. He's a hell of a coach. He's, he's deserving as well. But in that instance, you don't respond that way. You say, you know, we in, we hired the best guy in our, that we thought was fit. You know, obviously, you know, we want to see change in this league too, but that was the ultimate result. Yeah. You know, we respect his, his stance, and, and obviously there's an issue right now. But that wasn't our stance in this case. And it's really hard to quantify or to explain someone's feelings if Brian Flores goes to sit down in the interview that he knows <clears> it's for a job, job that's already been decided. It's – you're, you're here because we have to check some box that we don't agree with mm -hmm. is what it comes across. And, and no one, and I personally can't put myself in the position to know what that feels like. There's dynamics here that some people just need to not talk about. And I can say what I did earlier and that just, it feels like it's the representation of the organization uh, is the part of the conversation that's not being had that I think is more along the lines of what's leading to the statistics that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um and whether that's right in your face or it's the subconscious, the unintentional, whatever it is, uh, that's the part that has got to fix. And like to your point, owners are owners. And yeah, 
they can't be checked like that. So you got to put it in the mainstream and talk about it. But, um, but yeah, I, I have a lot of respect for Brian Flores putting that out there because yeah. the, the amount of backlash, you know, you're going to get, it's going to get worse before it gets better, but hopefully the whole conversation leads to positive things. And, and I'll, and I'll put it this way. I mean, there's black coaches all over the league that aren't head coaches that are position coaches that are offensive coordinators that, that, that represent, you know, each organization at uh, some a certain extent. Um, mm. Those guys need to be in the locker room. The league is 73% black. There's cultural differences. This has nothing to do, I mean, race, of course, but it's cultural differences. Black players relate with black coaches because we grew up the same way. We've had the same experiences. So it's nice to have those guys around. And that's yeah. all I'll say on that. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Let's let's switch gears and talk a little bit about the defensive side. I know we talked about it at the top of the show uh, with Steve Spagnolo and the decision um, with him. And I think the, the Kansas City Laboratory guys, so Kent Craig and Matt talked about this on the show last week uh, when we were in Las Vegas. They did this recording of, you know, it's an interesting puzzle to put together the Chiefs defense for next year because you talk about a lot of those leaders, a lot of those alphas won't be back. I mean, Tyron Matthews most likely not coming back. Um, and if it is, it's going to be a I don't know how you can quantify anything other than a, a heel turn by the Chiefs personnel staff because of the timing. Because to your point, if they were to get something done, this would have happened before uh, he gets a chance to hit free agency and, and change yeah. the market for himself. So knowing that the defense is going to look completely different, um, you don't know Anthony Hitchens. Um, he's got one of those contracts where it could kind of go either way, uh, depending upon the business side of how they want to do it. But you're losing some key pieces to that defense. And with Steve Spagnuolo, who I, I'm i a fan of Steve Spagnuolo. I don't think we won a Super Bowl without Steve Spagnuolo. Nope. I know he's a popular guy to hate on um, and all of those things. But we finished in the top 12 in scoring in all three years that he was here. And again, I don't think we won that Super Bowl three years without him. Uh, but I will say that for an older coach, um, guy who's been around, I don't know. I've never talked to him. I don't know if he wants to keep coaching. I don't know any of those things. But – you lose the key pieces of your defense. You're rebuilding that with young players that you have to then teach again to be the leaders of your defense and how you want to do it. And that's a bigger lift than it was when you have Tyron and Frank. And that's an obvious thing, but that's a lot more work for a defensive coordinator and for a coach to rebuild the same image trying to replace guys you just left with the same defense. So their point was, if you're going to rebuild it, maybe you bring in a young defensive coordinator to get his young key guys to not try to reinvent what you just had with new guys. What do you, I mean, you've been in these rooms, obviously you've played different organizations. How does that narrative that that thought process kind of fit with, with what you think? I, I don't think that's the way to go. I think we stick with, yeah. with what we got from a coaching standpoint. And kind of rebuild from that. We have two good young linebackers. You know, the hitch thing going away. His leadership is very important. But I think Gay and um, Bolton are hell of a players. Hell of a players. Um, they're going to get the job done. There's someone in the building right now that they probably have trust in us developing as we speak. Um, there may be someone that they draft. I mean, we didn't know we were going to get Creed Humphrey and, and Trey Smith last year. I mean, draft, free agency. Some, they may be get a deal on someone. They may be able to go get a big fish. They're going to have a lot of money to play with. Um, I just got a feeling this offseason is going to be focusing on, you know, getting Patrick more weapons. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but, like, we really lacked um, explosiveness outside of, you know, Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey. And it was nice. We saw a glimpse of adding an extra layer with Jarek McKinnon this, you know, this playoff season and what it could do for the offense. And I feel like Veach is probably in the office like, you know, that's what we're missing, whether it be Jared coming back, whether it be them getting, you know, a number two receiver that they could get the ball to that can get open, you know, consistently. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it you have the best player in the world and you've got some money to play with. And that's why, you know, they, those guys talk about it. it's going to be a fun off season, and there's a lot of ways that you can go with it. Um, but I agree with you. I want them to bring Spags back. I like the aggressiveness. I like. Um, the dynamic they have between the coaches and everybody. We saw the news that, um, you know, with Matt House, the linebackers coach, and it was reported a while back that he was going to be the new defensive coordinator at LSU, yeah. uh, that there was a, a position open as linebackers coach, and uh, he was promoted yesterday that Brendan Daly, uh, the defensive line coach, is moving up. He's going to coach linebackers. And I was – when the news came out, I would, actually Tucker told me, and I my reaction was, well, Spags is staying. 
And you just, it's like, I don't know how you, and I know coach Reed could do that. Maybe you tell me if I'm wrong, but it would be strange for me that they're promoting assistant defensive coaches um, before high, like if Spags isn't going to be the defensive quarter and yeah. moves like that would be a little strange. Yeah. And that, that, that officially announced the Spag is, is staying. And when you internally elevate people, you're just moving yeah. pieces around. The main piece is going to stay in place. And that's Spags being the coordinator. You want to keep that continuity, um, that, mm-hmm. that, that core together. And I do think Spaz, he's aggressive and he takes heat sometimes for some of his decisions, but he's a hell of a defense coordinator. There's not many guys that I would take over him right now. Personnel wise, I think we need to figure some things out. The biggest thing that I think we need is pass rush. Um, mm-hmm. We need to figure out how to get to the quarterback besides Chris Jones. Um, Melvin Ingram brought a spark there, but we need to consistently get to the quarterback. We saw it during the playoffs. Like, we didn't get very many, you know, sacks. Not not enough pressure None. to affect court, yeah, to affect <laughs> um, opposing quarterbacks, and and that's ultimately what killed us on the defensive side of the ball. We can talk about yeah. offense and how we just fell asleep in the second half, but I think we need to focus on that defensively. You know, maybe get a corner or something, and, and go from there. I said it's going to be a fun off season if you like the roster building and the just the the hope and all the things that the NFL is so good about selling every year, but. For Chiefs fans, it's it's that entitlement of you have the best player in the world. He's 26 years old mm-hmm. and he stays healthy. He's going to be good. Brett Veach is not going to have <laughs> Patrick Mahomes not having the weapons that he needed. <laughs> I think last offseason it was that you know aggressive correction on the offensive line. And we saw yeah. what he did. And it's just where is he going to sink his energy into just putting a completely new uh, you know, personnel group of people out there? Is it going I- to be – the skill positions, is it going to be the defense, or is it going to be both? You've seen I, he's got some I, money. I think he's going to go this offseason, just seeing the trajectory of it. He went free agency back when he got Tyron and Frank Clark and spent mm-hmm. big money on the defense. I think this time he's going to do it on the offensive side of the ball and kind of invest in the defensive side of the ball through the draft and build young, yep. get a good group, and go from there. That's you know more of a future thing on the team building side of things. But, you know, for immediate impact and getting Patrick what he needs, you know, I think if he does that, that's going to give us a boost. I think, honestly, if we had that guy this year, we'd be in the Super Bowl right now. You know, somebody yeah. that we could could really rely on, like, you know, maybe like Odell Beckham Jr. or something. I don't know. If if Brett Veach has the kind of offseason this year that he did last year, I th- – the Chiefs, I mean, we t- we said it three years ago, so it can go in one ear and out the other and anything, you know, any given Sunday. But they have an offseason this year like they did last year. Get some pieces on the defense. Get that that elite pass rusher, hopefully a younger guy that you can kind of develop. You don't have to, mm-hmm. you know, overpay guy. I hate saying that, but I don't think anybody in the NFL has paid what they're worth. Everybody's either paid a lot more because of the market and when they become yeah. a free agent um, or they're completely underpaid. Um, so – It'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. But, Jeff, before we wrap up this show, what is your kind of number one thing that you're looking forward to going into the offseason? The number one thing I'm looking forward to? I mean, right now, it's just letting these guys rest and recover right now. I know how 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 mentally taxing it is losing a big game like that. So letting these guys recharge. But outside of that, once they get back into the groove of things, I'm really looking forward to just how the draft goes. I'm not a big fan of, like, free agency. Like, like you said, a lot of times it's like a bidding war and guys get overpaid. And usually it doesn't work out. I'm really looking forward to the draft and what Veach, you know, does and, and some of the diamonds in the rough that he finds. I mean, like I said, like no one expected Trey Smith and Cree Humphrey to be this outstanding this, this soon. And I know he has some guys that we not, we're not even thinking about right now that he has on his board. So I'm excited to see what he does. Hopefully we we guess right and we talk to a few of those guys. Uh, when we were out at the Shrine Bowl in Las Vegas, uh, we've been out there the last seven days, NFL draft event, uh, getting ready uh, for the draft. But we'll have coverage at KC Sports Network um, throughout the draft. A lot of cool stuff uh, we have coming up that we'll announce here probably in a couple of weeks. But uh, we'll have all that coverage. We'll get hit free agency first, uh, get through that, and then uh, get into the draft and all that good stuff. But a lot of cool uh, storylines, a lot of just intrigue about the Chiefs offseason. They're going to have some money. They've got some big decisions um, to make, um, ones that we know most likely are coming, uh, but some other ones that you never know. Uh, yeah. Veach, 
he's aggressive. And if he sees something, he's going to go out and get it. So that, that part's going to be interesting, uh, you know, checking Twitter and, and checking for updates throughout the off season. But Jeff, man, I appreciate it. And again, uh, we'll have Mike back on next week. Uh, he had some stuff he had to take care of, but gave him the week off, but appreciate everybody for listening to this. Um, and as always, you know, stay, stay safe, um, be kind to each other. And we appreciate you for listening to this episode. We will catch you guys next time. Go Chiefs.